how are you? Um, I'm in this very, very quiet place. So, while I'm in this quiet place, I thought I could read the next three chapters of Peter and the Starcatchers because it's getting pretty good. So, um, there's like a here going in here. It's making kind of a worrying sound. So, that's what that is. It's not too loud. So we are on chapter fourteen. Wonderful book. Very exciting. And um, I'm not going to do a total recap because we're kind of getting to the point where if you've seen any of the videos before this, you'll get like a full recap. Um, but I will say that when we last left off, um, Molly was talking to the porpoises and gave them a message that the wasp was being pursued um, <clears throat> and um, the porpoises went to Molly's dad ship the wasp and they can communicate with each other as you know maybe um, and told Molly's father that there was a ship in pursuit. This thing's clicking a lot. Hmm. So, um, they have just seen the black stash come after the wasp um, with a giant brassiere as a sail. So someone had some rather large breasts and it gave Blackstash an idea to make a sail, I guess, but it worked. So, it's like the fastest ship ever sailed in the seas of this fantasy. So, uh, let's see, that's pretty much where we are right now. Peter's mad at Molly because he knows that she's hiding a secret. So, um, let's start on chapter 14. It's called The Alliance. Peter found Alf the next morning. The big man was down on his aching old knees, scrubbing the deck. The wind was picking up. To the west, Peter saw gathering clouds, dark and threatening, though still a good way off. They made the ship feel smaller to Peter. Alf looked up as the boy approached. Hello, little friend, he said, grinning. Seen any flying rats? No, said Peter, but I'm going back to look. Alf's grin disappeared. To the aft hold, he whispered. To the trunk? Yes, tonight. But there's a guard there, said Alf, and he'll be wary. Slank was right furious at John for falling asleep last time. Had him whipped good and proper. He put a new man on guard, an ornery old scone called Leatherface. He won't be dozing. I thought about that, said Peter. I have a plan to get past the guard. Do you now, little friend? I do, said Peter. I see, and you were thinking old Alf would be your helper? I was. Alf stood, towering over Peter, and put a calloused hand on the boy's shoulder. Hear this, lad. Slink told the crew that if he found out who was in that hold, or found anybody else going in there, he'd feed them to the sharks. 
It's a good plan, Peter said stubbornly. It will work. Alf studied Peter's face for a moment. You really want to get to that trunk, don't you? He said. Yes, sir, I do. Bad enough to risk your life? Sir, said Peter. I don't have much of a life now, and from what I'm told, I'll have even less where I'm going. If there's something wonderful on this ship, I want to know what it is. This is my only chance, sir. Alf looked out to the sea for several seconds. Then back to Peter, and Peter saw there were tears in the big man's eyes. Little friend, Alf said, those words are truer of me than they are of you. He moved closer and put his head next to the boys. Tell me our plan. Okay, well that was the shortest chapter in the history of literature. It was two pages. Chapter 15 is called The Attack. Captain Scott stood alongside the Wasp's helmsman, calling out commands that were relayed to the crew via the first mate's booming voice. Leonard Astor stood just behind Scott, his attention fixed on the ship pursuing them. The Sea Devil was gaining. No matter what maneuver Scott tried, the enormous black brassiere grew steadily larger, blotting out much of the sky. For all the peril they had faced, Leonard and Scott retained their British calm, sounding like two gentlemen discussing the weather. He will be upon us soon, Scott said. It appears so, Leonard answered. I would not have thought it possible, said Scott, shaking his head. Those sails, I... He trailed off, then added, I assure you, sir, my men will be ready. We will repel them. Esther was quiet for a moment, studying the sea devil. Now close enough that he could easily see the scowling faces of the pursuing pirates, waving swords and shouting vile taunts at their quarry, he turned to Scott. Captain, he said, I request to be put overboard in a dory with the trunk at once. Scott stared at him, his composure momentarily deserting him. Are you daft, man, he said. You can't outrun that ship in a dory. No, Leonard agreed, but it would force Black Stash to make a choice. If he chooses to go after me and the trunk, and I believe he will, then he'd turn broadside to the wasp. Leonard paused a moment, and if your cannon were made ready and waiting, he'd be squarely in the line of fire, said Scott. He thought about it, clearly tempted for a moment, then shook his head but so would you. I'm sorry, sir, but I can't put you at risk like that. You'll stay on board. The two men locked eyes for five long seconds, then Astor spoke again, his voice low and urgent. Captain, I remind you once again that I am on a mission for the queen and that I speak with her authority. The trunk must not, cannot, fall into the hands of this pirate. Your men are brave, but clearly outnumbered. If the enemy boards us, we will be defeated. My plan involves risks, but it is our only hope. On the authority of Her Majesty, I order you to have your men put me in the trunk over the side immediately. Scott reddened and appeared to be on the verge of arguing. Then slowly he exhaled and turned to the first mate. Prepare a dory. Prepare a dory to starboard, he ordered. Bring up Aster's black trunk. Have the men prepare the starboard cannons. The first mate hesitated, surprised by the unexpected orders. At once, Scott said. Aye, Captain, the first mate relayed the orders. Thank you, Captain, Leonard said. Do not thank me, sir. I fear those orders are your death sentence. Well, said Aster, perhaps we can lessen the danger. Scott answered with a questioning look. I believe you have an archer in your crew, said Astor. I do, said Scott. Leonard gestured up the, to the sea devil's huge billowing double coned sail, now looming almost overhead. That garment appears to be made of a fine fabric, he said. I suspect it would burn very well. Scott squinted at it, then looked at Astor with a small smile. So it would 
he said. You've seen battle, Mr. Astor. That I have. Scott turned to his first mate. Send for Jeff the archer, he said. He'll want his bow and some flame. Blackstash stood at the helm of the sea devil, watching his crew work as the ship closed on its prey. The ladies had performed as hoped. The sea devil felt almost as if it were flying across the water. The wasp, sleek and fast as she was, didn't stand a chance. Just wait till the ladies are raised on that mast, he thought. Not a ship in the world where I'll outrun her. This pleasant thought was interrupted by Smee's high-pitched voice. Cap'n, they're getting ready to launch a dory. Stash snatched the spyglass and had a look. He drew a sharp breath. Not only were the wasp crewmen getting a dory ready, but it appeared that the passenger was a man in gentleman's clothing and the cargo was a black trunk. What trickery is this? Stash frowned, pondering the situation. Was the trunk a decoy? If he turned to pursue it, the ladies would lose the wind and be useless. The wasp would regain the advantage and quickly put water between them. But if he let the black chest escape and it proved to be the treasure, Captain, should we? Out of my way, shouted Stash, shoving, shoving Smee aside and striding quickly amidships, stopping at the cage, holding the prisoner. He knelt reached through the iron bars, grabbed the man by the coat of his now filthy uniform, and pulled him close so that only the rusting cage separated their faces. The prisoner recoiled from Stash's foul breath. Stash shoved the spyglass into the man's hands. You tell me, mate, Stash said, that their trunk being loaded off the wasp, is that the treasure? The prisoner, weak with hunger and fear, trembled so badly that Stash had to support the spyglass for him. Jeez. Black and shiny she is, Stash said, helping him find it, wearing a gold emblem, emblem on her sides. Y yes, the man stammered. That's it, sir. Stash leaned back, appraising the man's terrified face. You understand, lad. If them words ain't true, they're your last on this earth. I, I, the prisoner tried to swallow, but could not. I swear, sir, that's it. Very well, said Stash to himself. He stood rubbing his chin absentmindedly, wondering if... Trouble, Cap'n? It was Smee hollering from the upper deck, his stubby right arm pointing up. Stash looked up. What now? And then he saw it. The ladies were burning. Captain Scott patted Jeff the archer on the shoulder. Good work, he said, nodding toward the sea devil. The right cup of the enormous brazier was afire, the flames spreading quickly. Stand ready, son, he said. We'll need you again. The archer, a thick, bald man, nodded. Scott looked across the ship to where Leonard Astor stood, waiting as sailors lashed the trunk inside the dory. Astor was staring at the trunk. Scott allowed himself a moment's speculation. I wonder what's in there to be worth dying for. Then called out to Aster. Good luck, Mr. Aster. God willing, we will have you back on board within the hour. Aster looked over his green eyes intense. He said nothing, answering only with the briefest of nods. He touched the gold chain around his neck, feeling for the locket as if assuring himself that it was there. Then he climbed into the dory and gestured to the boatswain, who barked a command. Four sailors swung the dory out on its davits and lowered the little boat into a surging sea, carrying a passenger and a cargo that Scott was duty-bound to protect. I had no choice, thought Scott. He gave me no choice. Then he turned to the task of trying to save his ship. Blackstash knew when to cut his losses. Scott had a reputation as clever as a sailor. The burning ladies were proof that it was justified. Cut loose the ladies, Stash ordered Smee. Cut them loose, Cap'n, said Smee. The ladies? Yes, you idiot, and now, before the masts and rigging catch fire, Stash said. 
Attach a mooring buoy to the starboard sheet, then cut them loose. We'll come back for them later. Smee relayed the commands and the crew responded quickly. The flaming ladies floated away from the ship like a gigantic kite, then fluttered and sank, falling into the sea with a loud hiss and a cloud of steam. The mooring buoy bobbed nearby, marking the spot. No wonder he's the captain, thought Smee. Stash looked ahead with his sails gone. His ship was now falling behind the wasp. Full sails, he bellowed to the crew, bypassing Smee. The men scrambled to the lines, and the Sea Devil's regular sails were up in seconds. Stash was counting on them to steal the wasp's wind, and he was gratified to see the fleeing ship's sails flutter. Now he knew he could catch the wasp, but should he? Or do I go after that dory? The little boat with the gentleman aboard was just ahead of the Sea Devil now, perhaps 40 yards to starboard, close enough that Stash felt as if he could reach out and touch the trunk. He could see the gentleman watching him intently, betraying no emotion. His oars idled at his sides, as if he wants me to come for him. Stash knew he could easily chase the dory down by tacking to starboard, but then he would lose his advantage over the wasp, or worse, expose his broadside to her cannon fire. He could pursue the wasp, but it would take time to overtake her and more time to defeat her. By then, he might not be able to find the dory again. What to do? Stash cursed a particularly foul curse and splattered the deck with an angry gob of spit. Nobody understands how hard it is being captain. With grudging respect, Scott saw how quickly blessed Black Stash rid himself of the burning black sail, raised new sails, and continued the pursuit. He's gaining again. He'll have us soon. Scott pondered his options. He could turn broadside and try using his cannons, possibly taking Stash by surprise. But he might already be close enough to board us before we can get off a shot. He could jibe, ducking away from the sea devil's sails, regain the wind advantage, and run for it. But that would be leaving Aster behind. He watched the dory and Aster growing smaller, now a beam of the sea devil. I can't leave him. He studied the sea devil. If he turns toward the dory, we will attack. But what if the sea devil did not turn? Could he risk his ship and his entire crew to save the life of a single passenger? Scott felt the eyes of his men awaiting his next command. Nobody understands how hard it is being captain. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, now we're back on the sea devil. Smee knelt next to the prisoner's cage and fumbled with a heavy ring of keys, nervous under Stash's glare. Hurry it up, Stash said, glancing up to check the wasp and then the dory, now a beam of his ship and slipping behind. The prisoner, not knowing what was happening, watched apprehensively as Smee unlocked the padlock and opened the cage door. Stash pus pushed Smee away, grabbing the trembling prisoner by his uniform coat and again pulling him close. You've been most helpful, said Stash, his voice oily. Thank you, sir, said the prisoner, daring to hope that his cooperation had won him freedom from the cramped cage. <clears throat> yes, continued Stash, very helpful, so helpful, in fact, that I've decided to let you go. Thank you, sir, said the prisoner. Thank no, please, sir, no. His gratitude turned to horror as Stash, in a startling display of speed and power, dragged him swiftly to the starboard rail and hurled him overboard. Cap'n, shouted Smee, shocked. Yes, Mr. Smee, said Stash, leaning over to watch as the prisoner thrashed, gasping to the surface. But he was, sputtered Smee. I mean, I thought he had that information that he gave us what we needed, said Stash, and now he's providing another service. Smee looked puzzled. Behold, said Stash, as a British seaman, he knows how to swim, at least a little. Smee remained puzzled. 
And as a British seaman in distress, continued Stash, he must not be abandoned by the gentleman in the dory, now can he. A proper Englishman would never leave another Englishman to drown. Behold our gentleman, Smee. Stash gestured toward the dory. Smee saw that the gentleman was reaching for his oars. Stash said, have the harpooners make ready at the stern. Smee relayed the order, noting as he did that the dory was now turning toward the drowning sailor. He ch his chapped lips broke into a broad smile of pleasure, both at the cleverness of his captain and the foolishness of a proper Englishman. Leonard Astor had been studying the trunk, wondering how he could get past its padlocks without tools or weapons, when he heard the scream from the sea devil and saw the man a man in the uniform of a British seaman hurled overboard. He saw the man struggle to the surface, thrashing desperately to stay afloat, but was clearly unable to last much longer. With no hesitation, Astor seized the oars. He understood that the pirates had thrown the seaman overboard in the expectation that he would do exactly this. But trunk or no trunk, Leonard Astor was not going to sit, sit by and watch an Englishman drown. He clung to the hope that, as he approached the sea devil, she would turn to him, thus exposing herself to the wasp's cannon. But to his disappointment, the sea devil did not turn. He's clever, he thought. He intends to slow my escape while he wins the wasp, then he'll come for me, for the trunk. Aster glanced back and saw that he was close to the sailor, still afloat, but just barely. I can still do it, Aster thought. With a bit of luck, I can save this man and still be far enough away that the pirates won't be able to find this tiny boat. The thrashing sailor slipped beneath the surface. Leonard pulled harder on his oars. Scott now saw that Stash had no intention of taking, I think that means like turning, like Scott now saw, Scott saw now that Stash had no intention of tacking to chase the dory. That must mean like turning the ship or something, tacking, T-A-C-K-I-N-G, never heard that before. Anyway. He's a clever one. He's coming for my ship first. Scott made a decision and gave an order, instantly repeated by the first mate. Hard to starboard. The helmsman spun the wheel and the obedient ship quickly healed, masts creaking, lines becoming taut. The sails went slack, shifted, then filled anew with wind. The sea devil was now coming up fast on his starboard side. He had a better angle on her now, better, though far from ideal. But there was no more time. In moments, the sea devil would be on them. Fire! The cannons roared, and Scott's heart sank as he saw the balls fly over the sea devil. The cannoneers had aimed almost level, but the heeling of the ship had pointed the barrels high. It had been a gamble, tacking and firing. Yeah, that totally is what it means. Star, he turns starboard and then he fired. So he's tacking and then he fired. Learn something new. It had been a gamble, tacking and firing, and now Scott was paying. The wasp had lost speed. The sea devil, undamaged, was bearing down. There was barely time for another round. Level her out, Scott roared. This time we must not miss. <clears throat> Leonard Astor heard cannon fire, then saw a ball, then two others splash near him as he shoved an oar deep into the water at the spot where he'd seen the sailor go under. He fought to hold the oar down, moving it side to side. Come on, take it. He'd almost given up when he felt a tug. Straining, he slowly pulled the oar towards him, then grabbed the sailor's arm and heaved him up with an effort that almost overturned the dory, which rode dangerously low in the water, now from the weight of two men and the trunk. The man coughed and spat seawater, but seemed to be all right. Thank you, he mumbled, still coughing. 
It's quite all right, said Aster. That madman, began the sailor, but he was interrupted by two loud reports. Aster spun and saw twin dark lines coming from the stern of the sea double and streaking directly toward the dory. Down, he shouted, yanking the sailor with him to the cramped bottom. The two harpoons, well aimed and shot with gunpowder, hit almost simultaneously, their barbed heads thunking into the transom. Ten-foot chains connected the harpoon shafts to thick rope leading back to the ship. In a moment, Aster felt a tug as the lines tightened. The dory began to move backward. The pirates were using winches to drag it to the sea devil. Black Stash is having it both ways, Aster thought with grudging admiration. He's going after the trunk and the wasp. He lunged to the stern and tried to work the harpoons loose, but they were lodged too firmly in the transom. Desperately, he turned back and shouted to the sailor, help me untie the trunk. What's that? The man was still groggy from nearly drowning. Untie the trunk, Leonard repeated, struggling with a thick knot, and hurry. The sailor managed to sit up and reach for a knot on the other side of the trunk. After a moment, he shook his head. Wet line, he coughed. This knot's not coming out until the line dries. Aster yanked desperately at the rope. He looked back. The dory was almost to the sea devil now, the pirate ship's stern looming overhead. At last, he managed to loosen the knot. He got his hands under the trunk and tried to lift it, hoping to work it free from the rope on the other side. He could barely budge it. Why is it so heavy? He tried to move it again, but he could not. He looked back again and saw that he could touch the stern of the sea double. Pirates were clambering down rope ladders to grab the dory. He gave one last desperate heave on the trunk, but it barely moved. It's no use. Scapt Scapton. Captain Scott held off as long as he dared, waiting for the wasp to level its cannons on the onrushing sea devil. When he could wait no longer, he gave his order. Fire! The cannons boomed. One ball struck the pirate ship's prow, beheading the wooden mermaid. The rest flew wide. The sea devil came on. We're going to be boarded, he thought. At least Aster may escape. But that hope was dashed almost immediately. Captain Scott, the first mate said, lookout reports the pirates have the dory. What? said Scott. How? Harpoons, sir. They got it when Mr. Astor turned back to rescue a sailor from the sea, sir. One of ours? I did not hear of a man going overboard. No, sir. It's Bingham, sir. Bingham? Scott could not believe what he was hearing. Yes, sir. Lookout says the pirates threw him overboard, sir. Bingham, Scott muttered. The sailor had gone missing at the last port. Scott now understood why Black Stash had followed the wasp. He knew about the trunk, and now he has it. He saw that the sea devil was still coming hard, pirates on the foredeck howling for blood. He wants the wasp too. Archer, Scott shouted. Sir, can you cut their halyards at this range? A little closer, Captain, and I think I can. Then do it. Bring down as many of their sails as you can. Aye, sir. Scott turned back to his first mate. He means to board us, he said, but I mean to board him first. Tell the men to go get swords and sabers and move to the stern. At my command, luff the sails. He'll catch us more quickly than he suspects, and when he does, we'll board him. Scott knew he was taking another gamble. I hope this one turns out better than the last. Blackstash could not believe how well things were working out. He had the treasure and he was about to take the wasp, which might have outrun him if Captain Scott had not chosen to turn and fight. Idiot Englishman, always doing what was right. Dory's aboard, Captain, Smee informed him. Excellent, said Stash. Glancing back, he saw the retaken prisoner and the idiot Englishman who'd rescued him. The trunk had been hoisted onto the deck. Twenty lengths and closing fast, came the shout from the crow's nest. Prepare to board, Stash shouted, his excitement building. This was the moment a pirate lived for. 
His men readied their swords, knives, and guns. Stash estimated that the two ships would come together in about five minutes. Glancing around the deck, he was seized by an impulse. Open the trunk, he shouted. Fifteen lengths and closing. But sir, said Smee, perhaps we should wait until after. Now, Stash roared, open the trunk. The greatest treasure ever sent to sea, Stash meant to see it now in this moment of glory. Two sailors fired pistols at the locks. The chains fell away. Stash saw the idiot Englishman move forward, staring intently at the trunk lid. What's that look in your eye, Englishman? Stash thundered. You think a genie's gonna jump out and save you? <laughs> something like that, the Englishman answered, and something in his voice unsettled Stash for just a moment. As he watched, the Englishman's head, hand reached inside his shirt. Grab his arm, Stash shouted. A burly sailor quickly pinned Aster's arms behind his back. Ten lengths. Cap'n, said Smee. We, quiet, said Stash, striding over to the Englishman and ripping open his shirt. A bright gold locket sparkled in the sun. What have we here, said Stash. He reached for the locket and his fingers touched it. He felt the strangest feeling as if five lengths. Sir, shouted Smee, I think they're going to board us. The Englishman pulled back, drawing the locket from Stash's grasp. Stash shook his head as if awakening from a dream. He saw that the wasp was less than three boat lengths away, its aft deck swarming with armed sailors. He turned, stared for an instant into the intense green eyes of the Englishman, then leaned over to the open trunk. Time seemed to stand still as the lids slowly came up. A smile formed on Stash's lips as he readied himself to gaze upon the greatest treasure ever sent to sea. What? he screamed. He looked up, his face twisted with, with fury. What trickery is this, Englishman? He grabbed Aster by the coat and dragged him around the trunk lid so he could see inside. The trunk was filled with sand. The Englishman gasped snapped his head up and looked out to sea, suddenly remembering Om's message on Molly's ship. Blackstash followed the man's gaze. He's as surprised as I am, he thought. And then Stash remembered there had been a second ship leaving port on the day he'd been watching the wasp. It, too, had taken many trunks aboard. They pulled a switch, didn't they, Englishman? Aster stared defiantly at the pirate. It's on the other ship, isn't it? said Stash. Aster's jaw clenched, but he remained silent. Two lengths! It seems you've been had, Englishman, said Stash, and so have I. But unlike you, I can do something about it, as soon as I have the wasp. Brace yourselves, came the shout from above. We're going to ram! Stash gestured to the burly sailor. Take the Englishman below and lock him up, he said. I'll deal with him later. The burly sailor reached for Aster, but just as he did, the prow of the sea devil struck the stern of the wasp. The deck shuddered violently and the sailor fell. Before he could get up, Leonard Aster, Leonard Aster had leaped overboard. Stash cursed and raced to the rail. Looking over, he saw nothing at first. And then, was that the back fin of a porpoise? There was no time to look further. An arrow whizzed overhead and the sea devil's main sail came cascading down on Stash and his clue, crew. The battle had begun. It only took a few bloody minutes for Captain Scott to understand the awful truth. His second gamble had also failed. His men fought courageously, but the pirates outnumbered them two to one. He could not stand watching his men being slaughtered in a hopeless cause. Despair seeping into his soul, he tied his white handkerchief to the tip of his sword and gave the signal for surrender. The flag was greeted by a sullen acceptance from his brave crew and howls, howls of triumph from the pirates. Scott's last desperate hope now was that he could bargain somehow for the lives of his men. But he held no hope for himself. He was the captain and he had lost his ship. The wasp now belonged. The black stash. 
And this is a bummer. This next chapter is only also two pages. And the next one's like three, so I'll just read them both. Chapter 16, Bad News. Molly crouched on the aft deck of the Neverland, watching the water, waiting. The hours had crept by with agonizing slow slowness, but it was almost time. At least tonight, she didn't have to worry about the men on watch. They'd found some rum somewhere, and when Molly crept by them earlier, they'd both been flat on their backs, snoring. Heaven help the ship if we ever face any real danger. Her thoughts were interrupted by the welcome sight of a dorsal fin breaking the surface, followed by the sound of a cheerful chitter. Molly leaned over the stern rail and despite her anxiety, smiled broadly as a familiar silver shape appeared. Hello, said Om. My teeth are green, replied Molly. Yes, agreed Om politely. With the formalities concluded, Molly clicked and chirped the message she'd been practicing all day. Om, um, see Molly father? Yes. Thank goodness. Carefully, Molly chirped. What news? Om um, hesitated, then, bad man have father ship. Holly, Molly's heart froze. Molly father, she struggled to make the sounds. Molly father, in water. Molly could barely breathe. Molly, father, she began, but Om mercifully cut her short. We swim, Molly, father, he said. Swim to island. Molly almost collapsed from relief. The other porpoises are taking father to the land. That's why Om came alone. But Molly, father, message, said Om. What message, said Molly. Bad man hump Molly ship. Fear stabbed at Molly. The trunk. Somehow, Blackstash knows about the trunk. Father must know as well. So he. Om um, chittered again. Father come. Soon. But would he be soon enough? Molly took a deep breath, fighting to control her feelings of panic to form the right sounds. Message father, she said. What message? Hurry. Hurry, repeated Om. Um. Yes. And with a brief farewell chitter, Om was gone, leaving Molly staring at the water, wondering how long it would take her father to reach land, to find a new ship, to set out to find her. Meanwhile, the world's most vicious pirate is hunting us down in the fastest ship afloat. Molly had never felt so alone in her life. If Blackstash arrives before her father did, she had no choice. She would have to deal with the situation herself. She had to and she could not fail. She needed an ally, someone she could trust. She turned for the rail to go look for him. As she entered the ladder way, she cast one last glance back at the sea. Please hurry. Okay, so this is the last chapter we're gonna read tonight. There hasn't been any pictures in these, which is weird. Usually we hit one by now. They're just later. Chapter 17, The Next Target. The sea devil and the wasp, tied side by side, rolled in the dark waves as Stash's crew, working by torchlight, finished the hard labor of moving barrels and crates from the conquering ship to the conquered one. Below decks on the wasp, Blackstash surveyed the tidy cabin that had once belonged to Captain Scott. A fine cabin, Mr. Smee, is it not? he said. Aye, cabin, it is, said Smee, thinking, and it smells much better than your old one did. Have the prisoners been dealt with? asked Blackstash. Aye, sir, as you ordered. Captain Scott and the others you wanted kept for ransom and barter are locked below. The rest will be set adrift in the sea devil once we've moved her sails and provisions to the wasp. Do you think it'll hurt me reputation, Smee, allowing them to die of thirst rather than slitting their throats? No, Cap'n, said Smee. I think it's a grand humanitarian gesture. 
We'll tell our boys to hurry before I change my mind, said Stash. It's turning to daylight and I want to get after that other ship. The one with me treasure. The, what's it called again? The Neverland, sir. Stupid name, said Stash. Yes, Cap'n. I don't much like the wasp either. No, Cap'n. A wasp is an insect. It is, Cap'n. We're pirates, me. Not insects. No, Cap'n. I mean, yes, Cap'n. A pirate ship name needs a name that inspires fear in the heart of every sailor who hears it, said Stash. He drummed his bony fingers thoughtfully on the desk that once belonged to Captain Scott. Smee said, what about the jellyfish? Stash turned and stared at Smee with a look that Smee, unfortunately, mistook for encouragement. I mean, the stinging kind, Smee continued brightly. I've seen grown men cry when they... Shut up, you idiot, thundered Stash. Jeez. Slamming the desk with his fist, he took a long, deep breath and then continued in a calm voice. You don't name a pirate ship the Jellyfish. I just thought, shut up, Smee. Yes, Cap'n. Sailors will not feel fear in their hearts at the approach of the Jellyfish. No, Cap'n. I shall give the ship a pirate name, Smee. Yes, Cap'n. I shall give it the name of the most feared flag on the seven seas, the pirate flag, Smee. That's a fine name, Cap'n. What is the pirate flag, Cap'n? Blackstash pressed his face into his hands. Smee, he said through splayed fingers, you have seaweed for brains. Yes, Cap'n. The name of the ship will be the Jolly Roger. But you just said, the Jolly Roger is the pirate flag, you kelp-brained idiot. Yes, Cap'n. Now get out of my sight and send in Story. We've got work to do. Story, who'd been waiting outside to be summoned, entered the cabin. Yes, Cap'n? Have you found the ladies? Yes, sir. Wimple went out in a boat and got him back. Good. We'll raise the sail as soon as we're done offloading the Sea Devil. We're after the Neverland next. Yes, Cap'n. One of the prisoners was kind enough to tell me a few things about the Neverland. Said Stash, not bothering to mention that the officer had been staring at the point of Stash's cutlass an inch from his right eyeball. He says she left port the same day the wasp did, and she's bound for Run Dune, same as the wasp was. She's a fat sea cow of a ship that can't make better than five knots, so she's well behind us. Aye, Cap'n. I want you to do your figuring and put us on a zigzag course back in her direction, 20 mile tax till we spot her masts. Understand? We'll be flying Her Majesty's colors. She'll sail right into us. Think we're the wasp. And then she's ours. Get to it. Aye, Cap'n, said Story, leaving. Blackstash drummed his fingers on the desk for another minute, wondering if he should go up and make a few prisoners walk the plank. He was tired, but it was important to keep up appearances. He was still pondering this when there was a tap on the door. It was Story again, looking ashen face. What is it, said Stash. Cap'n, it's, I think you need to come on deck and see for yourself, Cap'n. Following the navigator to the deck, Stash saw it instantly, a dark roiling mass of clouds spreading across the horizon, already huge and growing, growing fast. Black Stash had spent his life at sea. He had long believed that he'd face the worst that the sea could hurl at him and that he'd had nothing more to fear. But seeing this thing coming toward him now, Black Stash, just for a moment, was afraid. Getting so into this. So it's going to start getting like pretty exciting and pretty interesting after this. So stick around for the rest of the book. We're about halfway through.
We're almost halfway through. We're getting there. So I hope everyone got to relax. Um, some restful, quiet time with a magical story. And I will see everyone in the next video. Bye.